Good. Okay, Rich, you're the chair. <laughs> um, okay, thanks everybody for coming to the final. Oh, oh, you can introduce me. <laughs> is this is this on? Yes. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce the eminent George Tamanaga. 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 Tamanga. Tamanga. George Tamanga. Nice Dutch name. It is. I see. Yeah, well, sure. So is so is Brower. That's great. Didn't really see we had much in common. Uh, George Tamanaga Fleming to speak about something which he's tried to explain to me many times, and I hope this time I understand it. Right. Okay. So this is my favorite topic that I only work on every time I go to a QCDNA. Uh, and so I, every few years I make incremental progress uh, on this topic, except I'm currently stuck. Uh, and this was great because the last time the QCDNA was at Yale, I was stuck. Uh, and uh, and thanks to people in the audience, they got me unstuck, and it led to a result, which I will show. It's kind of a not-so-new result anymore, because it was the last time it was at Yale. And so now I'm stuck again on this low-latency problem, or high-latency, I guess. Uh, and I could do some help. OK. So this was going to be, initially, I thought this would be a really ambitious talk. Uh, where I would explain everything that everybody's doing, but then I realized that um, people are just doing, for the most part, what they've always done, uh, and so there's not really that much to explain, so I want to focus on where I think the problems lie. Okay, so but first let me set the big picture. We heard, uh, actually, in the very beginning, Ballant did a nice job of overviewing the whole workflow of a, of a lattice gauge theory calculation. And really, um, you know, to go from uh, idea to published research, it relies on three steps, usually. Uh, first, you have to uh, uh, generate the lattices. This, uh, of course, there's a lot of steps before that. You have to have the idea. You have to write the code, all that kind of stuff. But you have to generate the lattices, and we heard some discussion about that yesterday. And then you have to compute some observable on the ensemble of lattices that you uh, calculate. And that's also uh, a hard problem. And both of those pieces mostly uh, are bottlenecked uh, up till now with doing uh, in linear solves. And so that's why so much of effort in this workshop goes to uh, speeding up linear solves and understanding linear solves. But then there's a third, which I, in my opinion often is the biggest bottleneck to actually getting to published research is at the end of the day when you run all your programs and you you generate your lattices and you compute observables out of the computer usually does not come a number which goes directly into the paper that's your the result at least a physically interesting result um, and so there's a whole other step that uh, is rather complicated and can actually delay quite a bit to getting from the calculation done on a computer to something that actually gets into a published paper. Um, and yet this step uh, often involves a, a, a set of numerical analysis, uh, um, a different type of numerical analysis than just linear solves. And so that's why I always keep bringing it up. Because it's, uh, you know, we can't always just do linear solves all the time. OK. All right. Uh, and I think I just said that. Uh, good. Um, and one of the things that's uh, come about lately is because we've done such a good job on linear solves and because computers have gotten more and more powerful, um, that we've moved beyond, we've moved into a regime where we're now getting more ambitious at the kind of observables that we can compute. Uh, so now we start to think about uh, situations where the cost of computing the observables far outweighs the cost of generating the lattices. Uh, and so, you know, we, or also there are observables where you uh, need to generate many lattices. So 10,000 lattices, 100,000 lattices, a million lattices. And then you have to compute, uh, you know, very noisy observables on them, and those 
noisy observables, you may have to do of order volume linear solves. And so they can become uh, very expensive calculations. And the lattice gauge generation is only a tiny fraction of the whole cost. Um, OK. So it's nice that we're getting to that regime. But when we get into that regime, uh, that usually that makes the analysis of the result of the data coming off the computer even harder. OK, so let me explain. Uh, let's see. Um, so here's my view of the big picture. Uh, the LHC uh, discovered a Higgs boson, which is a scalar particle. Uh, in uh, quantum field theory, uh, we tend not to like uh, fundamental scalar particles. Um, maybe that view is changing now that we've discovered one. Uh, but if you're the if you're the kind of person that doesn't like, for technical reasons, uh, thinking about scalar particles as being fundamental scalar particles, you can uh, pretend that they are some kind of composite particle made of quarks and gluons like you would have in QCD. And so one can imagine that maybe you want to study um, a particle like the Higgs boson if you could find the right theory, the right kind and number of quarks and gluons. Then you might want to study the properties of this composite Higgs boson on the lattice. Um, and this is one of these uh, kind of uh, observables that's a very hard observable. It's so hard, there's, there is an analog of the Higgs boson in QCD. Uh, it's the lightest uh, scalar meson, the so-called uh, F0500. And to date, I don't think there's been a, a successful calculation of its mass. Uh, of course, experimentally, there hasn't really been any successful uh, observation of its mass either. Um, maybe now they're starting to. Successful calculation of mass and its observation. OK. Now, uh, well, I guess they would say it has more or less been observed. Yeah. Uh, it's, anyways, well, let's not get into the, that particular technical detail about what is the meaning of the F0500. <laughs> right. You could say, oh, but I do know that there has not been a very serious lattice calculation. OK. Um, and here, let me explain a little bit why it's so hard, if I did all of the algebra right. So we want to calculate this two-point function. and. Uh, you know, usually when we calculate if, as an observable that we calculate on our ensemble of lattices, as a two-point function, we do this Grassmann integration and we basically get, you know, there could be uh, various contraction matrices that go in here that contract color and spin indices. But, you know, when we uh, do the Grassmann integration, we uh, pair up size and side bars and replace them with the Dirac matrix, the, the inverse of the Dirac matrix, which is our propagator, M. And this is usually the, if, if this term is there and the second term, the double trace term is not there, then you're golden because this is really easy to calculate. And so forever, this is the, the kind of thing that people have been calculating. Unfortunately for uh, the, this state here, the scalar state, um, both of these terms are here. And in the case of uh, uh, if it's going to be a, a composite scalar state like the Higgs boson, this is the dominant term. The double trace term has to be the dominant term, not the single trace term. Um, now, this double trace term is easy to compute because we have uh, on the torus an exact translation invariance. So that allows us to essentially say uh, we can calculate uh, this uh, term by uh, basically s fixing x prime and t prime to be at zero. So we and so uh, and then so we only need to we don't need to calculate the full inverse. Uh, we only need to calculate one row, if you like, x zero x prime equals zero, t prime equals zero. So we just need to calculate one row of the inverse or one column, however you want. But for this term, this is kind of a disaster because 
for this double trace term, what we really need is not a single row or a single column of the inverse. We need uh, not the whole inverse, but we just need the diagonal. So, and it turns out that, you know, using linear solves, at least by the usual mechanism, this is calculating one row is easy. It's one linear solve. Calculating the diagonal is uh, order the dimension of the matrix, linear solves, unless you guys know some smarter way to do it. Okay, so this is, this is the problem. Um, and so, and this is, you know, generically these terms would be there, but oftentimes they're either small and we can neglect them, or they're by some symmetry, uh, they're not there at all. And so we don't we don't bother, uh, uh, and and life is good. But for this observable, not all, like the Higgs, uh, the correlation function from which we can extract the Higgs mass, it's both uh, there, definitely there, and that's the key. If if the Higgs is going to be a composite particle in light, it's the key reason is because this term dominates the the hard term dominates the easy term. And that's very interesting, and everyone wants to study it. Okay. Now, um, something that I didn't know for a long time, but uh, was pointed out to me eventually, was um, one of the things that we, uh, uh, well, if you had some way of constructing uh, the diagonal, just the diagonal entries of the inverse, uh, you could stick them all in a vector. Uh, and then normally when you want to calculate this uh, two-point function, you have to calculate the convolution of this vector with itself. Um, and uh, oftentimes also we want to subtract off what we call the, uh, there's another use of the word disconnected. This, we, want to, we want not the full two-point function, but just the connected two-point function. So we calculate the vacuum expectation value of the, uh, operator itself. So in some sense, this is just getting rid of, uh, I guess, the uh, translationally invariant constant that would come. Um, now, this, it turns out this itself, just calculating, you know, all of these products can be an expensive operation if you have a really big lattice. But if you use fast Fourier transform, you know, this uh, cooley tukey algorithm, uh, that actually you can calculate this. Uh, at, once you have it Fourier transform, you can calculate this very easy. It's just an inner product. Okay, so I think that uh, maybe lots of people know this. Certainly there was within months of the fast Fourier transform algorithm, people realized you could do this trick. Um, but actually one thing is very nice about this particular trick is that when you go into Fourier space, uh, it's very easy to distinguish, to, to differentiate between the connected piece and this disconnected contribution, the vacuum contribution, because the vacuum contribution only shows up in uh, Q equals zero. So uh, you can, if you like, only work with non-zero momentum and then uh, whatever, you know, fit this to some function if you like, and then just extrapolate to get the zero momentum piece. And then the difference between the modeled Q equals zero contribution and the uh, computed Q equals zero contribution is just that disconnected piece. Sometimes this is a, it, you, it depends on how hard it is to calculate this disconnected piece directly in the first place, whether this is a benefit or not. Um, so, okay, the first question I have for the mathematicians, and I'm not getting a positive uh, response, is there some, easier way to, uh, you know, estimate the, uh, uh, the just the diagonal of the inverse rather than having to do order volume solves that it would take me to get the whole, in I mean, essentially, if I'm already going to do order the dimension of the matrix linear solves, it's like I've already got the whole inverse and I'm just throwing away the off diagonal piece. So it would be nice if there was some way to do less work because I don't need the whole inverse, I just need the diagonal. I, I, so, uh, yeah, I can easily get any mom, any, uh, mom, yeah, let me go back to that. 
Yes, I can get any momentum out of this that I want. Uh, yeah, so the issue of what momentum I get has to do with, uh, let's see, I've already sort of, in some places I've cheated here and I've already used translation invariance. Right, if I'm just doing Fourier transforming these things, I would have P and P prime, and then when I integrate over all space, that gives me a delta function in P and P prime. But if you think about here, I've sort of written it. It's not clear what dimension I'm doing the Fourier transform in. So if you like, think of this as a four-dimensional Fourier transform. Uh, if I only want the three spatial components to be zero, then I'm just picking out you know, P, P vector equals zero. But in fact, by this method, very cheaply, if I Fourier transform my observable on every site in all four dimensions, I get, just by inner product, all momenta. So one very powerful way that, uh, that we often don't think about how to do this is if I could calculate the two-point function in momentum space for all momenta, if I knew what the dispersion relation was, I don't have to fit just P equals zero. I could fit all momenta. Now, unfortunately, I, in lattice QCD context, we don't know what the um, dispersion relation is. I mean, we can say we can, uh, I don't know, compute the dispersion relation of a free boson on a lattice, if you like, and fit it to that. We can take the low momentum and expand it and fit it to a continuum-like dispersion relation. You can do a lot of different games, but we don't know the exact dispersion relation. Otherwise, we'd have a volume more increase in data. One of the things that Rich and I have been working on is trying to do conformal field theories. If there, if the theory is really conformal, we know exactly the dispersion relation over the, so we know exactly the function to fit this to because there it's fixed by conformal symmetry exactly. So that's an interesting, um, but actually if you wanted to study the dispersion relation of let's say any meson or something like that on the lattice, this is how you get a much cheaply, much more cheaply than going into uh, trying to do it in position space. You have a comment, Rich? I'm trying to understand the question, actually. Okay. I mean, the, the, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what I'm asking exactly. So I'll say it, and you can. All right. It. I mean, translation invariance says that m x x is the same for all x. Uh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So somehow, I think. The question that's being asked is that if you had a momentum space, you assume that. So maybe you should not ask the question of how to do the inverse in coordinate space. No, you have to start with the inverse in coordinate space. Oh, I'm sorry. The problem is you want the correlation. Well, it depends what you're trying and to do. Yeah, if I'm trying to get the correlation function, the no, two-point yeah, function. No, I'm sorry. If you want the correlation function, then you, then you can't use translation invariance, I guess. Right. Because you're trying. Okay. This is a oh no, now it's a question of language. You want the connected piece of the disconnected piece. Yeah. Right. It's it's a misnomer that it's disconnected. It's, I, I always hate yeah. This 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 oh, language I, I is very. We use disconnected in two word, different ways. We use the word uh, quark disconnected when something's only disconnected by quark lines. <laughs> right. That's right. So you don't want the translation invariant piece. Yeah, that's we throw that out. That's the that's the. Vacuum, whatever you want to call it, the disconnected part. When you're part. looking for the connected. Yeah, if you want the connected so two-point two function. Things. In the early graph, when you were looking at the connected thing, yeah, if then you wanted. There the, was connected in terms of single trace, right. the, these and quark then, line connections. And then you really do want to get rid of everything. Right. But if you're trying to look at the quark disconnected piece, you need the connected piece of the quark disconnected Yes, piece. if you like. <laughs> or the vacuum subtracted, uh, or I don't know, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, just based on, on how M looks like, I would expect that the diagonal of M should be somehow fluctuating around something, but exactly this is what you want to get. Right? Well, we, yeah, we need to subtract the whatever it's fluctuating around, okay. right? Yeah. So, if you like, this is like a central, uh, central moment. So we're trying. We're subtracting off the average value of, right? Um, 
Right. But we don't care about the, the, the mean value. We only care about the correlation of the fluctuations around the mean. <laughs> okay. All right. So one side comment. Um, well, okay. So it would be really great if uh, the, the mathematicians could show us how to do this more cheaply. I mean, what we do now is we have uh, basically noisy estimators for this, uh, or we do some subset of the diagonal, but not the whole diagonal. But, uh, you know, it, it just seems crazy. You have to compute the whole matrix, the whole inverse, and then throw most of it away just to get the diagonal. But maybe that's just life. Um, okay, also this past convolution, uh, there, was, there was some discussion over the past couple of days about autocorrelation and how hard it is to measure autocorrelation. I think that, that it's kind of crazy not to... Uh, study autocorrelation in frequency space uh, because this is this one just calculating the autocorrelation function is of this type of uh, fast convolution. This is what it was. This was what it was originally dis meant to do when it was described in '66 as essentially calculate an autocorrelation function. But also, um, it's very what we care about in the autocorrelation function is just this connected piece and. So, and, and one thing that's a little bit tricky in when you're doing the autocorrelation function is getting rid of this, this, this other piece, the translation invariant piece. You want this connected piece. Uh, and also, um, you know, we don't really necessarily have a good uh, understanding of what the, that function is in position space, but we're really only interested in the low momentum version of it anyway. So I think that you're much better off studying autocorrelations in momentum space. Uh, and it's faster, much easier to compute, uh, particularly if you, you say I've got 100,000 uh, um, 100, long time series, it's much, uh, 100,000 log 100,000 is a lot faster than 100,000 squared. Okay. All right, so uh, let's say however we got this correlation function and what people do now is uh, you know, as I said, you calculate something like of order a uh, thousand disconnected lattices, which mainly means you, or many thousand disconnected lattices, which mainly means you have many tens of thousands or a hundred thousand uh, HMC trajectories, and then they, using either some subset of the diagonal or some noisy estimator of the diagonal of the inverse, they calculate this correlation function, and now in order to get at the masses, or if you like, the energies, or the rest energy is the mass, uh, in order to get at the, the, the rest mass of the, uh, of the Higgs boson or whatever the state is, we have to fit it to some function. Uh, we have to model it with some function. And a simple uh, function, this doesn't necessarily take into account any of the issues of the boundary conditions, but a simple function is just a falling exponential. And from this exponential fall off, we can e extract the, the ground state uh, energy of the particular state we want to look at. But the important thing is we can't usually construct a correlation function for just one single particle. We get all the particles that have the same symmetry properties, what we call quantum numbers. We get, all, we get a, a, a sum of all of them. And so we have, to, we have this uh, now a, a time series that we compute in the separation between the observables, that's this t, and uh, we have to model it with the sum of exponentials. And the dominant exponential, that's the lightest mass. It, it may have, if, if it turns out the Higgs is uh, one of these composite particles, then for the most of the calculations that we'll do, that ground state energy is the Higgs, but it could be in a situation like QCD where the thing that you would call F0500, one reason why it's so hard to do in QCD is because it's not the ground state. It's not even the next level. It's like two levels up. And the, the other states that are lower energy are these multi-particle pion states. First question? Uh, uh, it's N. 
A n times a is tn, if you oh, like. Oh, n. n. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote it this way. Yeah, okay. This I, okay. Uh, yeah, but I can solve it analytically. So this was, this is, I grabbed this out of a slide uh, circa the last time QCDNA was Yale, at Yale. And I put this problem up and I said, I really wish that I could solve this Vandermon problem. Because, you know, it's a rectangular Vandermon system, you know, like. And I said, I, I know how to solve it for, uh, you know, m equals 1 and m equals 2. Uh, it should have others, you know, I could probably, there are ways I solve it numerically, but it was really frustrating to me that with a structured problem like this that there isn't a, uh, not not uh, not necessarily. Okay. Well, let me. So let me explain. I, I guess I should have kept the slides. The this salute the solution to this. Uh, Victor Pereira, who was here in 2007, showed me how to solve this problem. No, 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 no. This. How to invert this matrix. There's an algorithm for how to invert this matrix. Or how to, you know, anyways, let me show you the solution. This is a solution. Uh, I have to write some determinant, if you like. Uh, this, this, this is, if you like, this determinant just generates the polynomial that I need to solve. Okay? So the way I've written it here, so the solution is some uh, polynomial equation that you have to solve and you have to find all the roots. This, uh, you know, writing it this way, uh, well, I like writing it this way, but I mean, this is, this system has been known, I learned only after the fact for uh, 300 years, uh, starting with Prony back uh, before, in around 1800. Okay, so people have been studying this kind of system for a long time and how to solve it. It's very hard. It's uh, algebraically within the zero error limit, one can find the solution. I mean, it's in some sense, this version of it is, here's a polynomial equation, find all the roots. One issue is, of course, the stability of those solutions under noise. Uh, and that's actually uh, basically the problem, is that uh, you just find the roots of this polynomial and you're guaranteed uh, m roots. You have a polynomial equation of order m, they're m roots, but which of those, first of all, this, uh, remember that this, um, I don't want to write, say it, uh, where is it, okay, this uh, variable x is e to the minus of positive number, so what do you do if x doesn't lie between uh, 0 and 1, you know, or it's, uh, or, so you, you have to worry about the issue is you, you certainly don't want any negative masses because we want this all to be positive energy states. So what do you do with eigenvalues that are, or, 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 sorry, solutions, roots of the polynomial that are bigger than one? Are those just some kind of noise? Do, how do you get rid of those? You know, so there's all that uh, issue to have to deal with is that I've got a huge number of solutions and I've got to sort through them and find the physically relevant one. And, and of course, we know that um, you know, given uh, 2m data points, this always gives m solutions, but we know these have noise, so really this is kind of an overfitting problem. This gives me a function that goes exactly through my 2m points. I know there's noise in my points, so I have to figure out of all my so solutions, which ones are solutions to noise and which ones are the, the actual physical solutions. So it's a difficult problem, but the nice part is, let's say I'm trying to study the F0500 in, in QCD with the uh, phys pions at the physical mass. I know there's a two pion state that's lighter mass. I know there's a four pion state that's lighter mass, and this is the third state. So I've got, I need at least three good solutions to be able to get at the F0500. Uh, um, okay. Uh, but, you know, the funny thing is, uh, as you were saying, if I'm working with just one correlation function, I might worry that uh, um, as I pull it far apart that I might lose a lot of noise. 
uh, and the problem will become really ill-conditioned. So I can calculate if I can construct uh, different operators that have uh, that also create this state with different weights. Uh, then I can, uh, you know, get a, a somehow orthogonal information that I can throw into this problem. And so this uh, we also solved that you if you have uh, not just one correlation function but k correlation functions. Uh, let me go back to the correlation function. They all have the same masses that appear. It's just the a's, the the, the uh, amplitudes or these coefficients in front are different. Okay, so different correlation functions. The the again the masses are the same. The co the coefficients in front are different. Um, then I can I again stuff them into this uh, thing and and hopefully this is a, a better condition system. Uh, and you know if, if you like I can even go to the limit where you know each uh, correlation function just contributes to one column of this matrix. So I mean I in principle I can uh, get a lot of information to the into this uh, system to the point where look if I have n t uh, Si if I, if my, the length of my time direction is nt, I should be able to get nt minus 1 solutions, always. That's the limit. Yes? Yeah, this is, well, find the roots of this polynomial. That's the analytic solution. What? No, well, no, I mean, there are, you know, root finding algorithms. Uh, yeah, well, Yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that issue. Yes. So, for the, for example, uh, I'll get to the generalized eigenvalue problem. But as I said, uh, if I have uh, more than one correlation function that couples to the same set of states but with different weights, uh, then you know I can put sorry I can put the k of them into this machine and generate the polynomial that I need to solve. If those, if you want to think of those as the entries of your matrix that, that will come into, you could do that here. But what, one thing that you're not um, getting there is you may be throwing away some information about uh, if. Uh, let me go back here. Uh, I intentionally wrote it to look like to suggest matrix valued indices. There may be like usually you can uh, construct this. Uh, Correlator and think of it as a matrix, and you can define these operators and everything such that this matrix is uh, Hermitian. So, the Hermitian nature of that matrix, you might not want to throw that away. That that uh, the issue of that uh, structure might be useful in helping you to solve the problem if you knew that you had Hermitian matrices. So, let me uh, talk a little bit about what to do if you think now thinking of your correlation function. Not as a uh, just a scalar valued function uh, as a you know as a function of the time separation, but as a matrix, and I'm going to assume that it's at least uh, Hermitian. You usually can arrange it to be Hermitian because we have a lot of freedom about how we define the operators. Where if for some reason it was not, you can always rotate the operator to make it Hermitian if you want. And what people usually do is they say, well, uh, if you look at the form, um, uh, too much flipping back and forth. If you start with this form, uh, and let's assume that there's only one exponential in this form, then there's uh, shifting the by in time by one is equivalent to multiplying by one power of this exponential. So. What people do is they set up a, what's a matrix pencil, or if you like, a generalized eigenvalue problem, which is find the uh, generalized eigenvalues xn that satisfy this uh, matrix pencil. And I, you know, I worked in this for a long time, and I stared at this forever, and I said, why do we ever stop here? It's this is the uh, you know, usually if you have a single correlator, the very first thing we do, which is so easy, is we do something called effective mass. We take two neighboring time slices and we divide them, and we uh, then take the log. And that's our rough guess as to what the mass is. So this is the same thing, but now I've promoted those uh, 
values of the correlation function to matrices. But, you know, we know that, uh, you know, just uh, trying to extract a mass from two time slices, we don't want that. We want to be able to use all the data of all the time separations that we have simultaneously. Uh, and I should say that everything I'm talking about in terms of analytic solutions, of course, one option always available to you is to do a big nonlinear least squares. Uh, and I think Ethan will talk a little bit about this, I hope. Uh, one problem downside of that is if you don't do something to uh, uh, stabilize the problem, it's notoriously unstable because everything's falling exponentially. Um, and so that's a hard problem. And so this is a way to try and get around that problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. You hear me? Yeah. Um, the x's you know, ought to be somewhat the same so long as t is in the plateau, right? Um, yeah, yes and no. Because remember, think about it, if you like, it's a, it's a generalized eigenvalue problem. So you can think of diagonal, you're diagonalizing this matrix in, the, I, in that I other understand. metric, but the metric keeps changing as you vary the time. No, I understand that it's not going to be perfect, but the idea of a plateau generalized to the matrix problem is to keep the x's constant for a range of t. Yeah. So can, how, what, how do you do that uh, constraint? Well, what people usually do is they fix t, well, they, they fix the one t, they said I have some reference time slice, relatively small, so that this matrix is important that one of these matrices not be singular, otherwise the, you get into some, it, life gets a lot harder. If one of these matrices is not, single, is not singular, then life is easy, because I can turn this into an eigenvalue problem by doing Cholesky decomposition on the non-singular guy. Okay, so in, in the usual thing, I take the square root of this and then I bring it over to the other side. And it's now a nice eigenvalue problem. Um, so what people do is they usually to take the correlator matrix to, to find a relatively short distance separation where you have good signal, and then they do diagonalize it or do a Cholesky decomposition. So you solve for the metric, and then you hold that fixed, and then you vary the separation between that and, and look at how the x depends on the separation time from your reference time slice where you fixed your metric uh, to the matrix some other time. So for example, if I shift by 2, it's just x squared. If I add 3, it's x cubed. So you can easily figure that out. Yes? Right. Yeah, you, usually if you have really good statistics, you know, some of the eigenvalues can be really stable, but it also, you know, one issue is it, it can depend a lot on where you choose the but reference. Then, but then you it, get something that looks stable, and then you shift your reference time slice, and the whole spectrum shifts. <laughs> right. But this is very much the same as, you know, just simple effective mass where you just, I have to pick some point in the plateau where I'm going to decide what my final answer is. And, but it, it depends a lot on, you know, where, where well, in the you plateau you are. readjust the x's, right? You want to have a good fit for the, all of the... I mean, you don't just you fix... You get the x out of the... Out of the, 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 the right. Yeah, but you want, to, you want to have the best compromise x for a range of t, right? Yeah, but that's... Again, I, I'm just trying to say that... Um, one could think, one could try and debate if the only thing I have is a, an effective mass plot, what's the best way to try and guess what the mass would be? Yeah, that's uh. No. Yeah, this is a, essentially a variant of the interlacing theorem that you imagine that this correlator matrix is just some sub matrix of a much larger matrix, which in fact we know that it is. This correlator matrix, in some sense, is drawn from it's some piece of the Hamiltonian, if you like, uh, and a very tiny piece, unfortunately. Uh, so. 
Um, yeah, but it basically, you start from the interlacing theorem and you say, let's say I had a complete Hamiltonian, now I eliminate one row and column, what happens to the spectrum if I get of this truncated Hamiltonian? The, the, but then you also have the advantage of doing exponential projection by separating them apart. So you're right, and so you can eliminate uh, contamination from states. The, the, the point that I wanted to make is that I'm trying to go back to this type of picture where I could generate this exact solution. Uh, I could use all the data that I had, every correlator, every time slice, all at once, and I could generate all possible solutions. Most of them I know are junk, and I, it's a very hard problem to try and figure out who's junk and who's real. Having lots of statistics helps you because you can study how the various solutions move around with statistics. So obviously, the, hopefully the physical ones uh, are the most stable under increase of lots of statistics. Um, but so the question is, how do I do this, but now with matrix value coefficients? Yeah. What's that? The next one, yeah, so I'm getting there. No, 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 this gives you already, if the dimension of this matrix is n, this gives you n solutions to begin with. You've already got n solutions. Now, so then I say, well, look, if I did this, why can't I combine three time slices, right? Uh, you could call it a higher order pencil. You could call it a matrix polynomial which means a polynomial equation with matrix value coefficients. And here's one example of a polynomial that I could write down. And this, while this will give me n solutions, this gives me two n solutions. But now I've used twice as much information that I had available to me already. And again, it's the same thing. I can, uh, you can read this book. There are ways to uh, solve this. And the important thing is one of these matrices has to be Usually the, the constant term, one of these matrices has to have, uh, uh, has to be non-singular. Yeah, N, N, yeah, I and J run, those are my N of operators. Well, I have a matrix of correlators, if you like. So I have N operators, so I form an N by N matrix of correlators. Again, that are separated by time t. So it's my matrix value correlation function. So you could see that if I have nt time slices, I should be able to form a matrix polynomial of order nt. And so I should be able to get, if I have n uh, operators to create my state, and I have nt time slices, I should be able to get of order uh, the number of operators times the number of time slices, maybe minus one, um, uh, solutions. Uh, and so I think, so, so I, from the people who do the matrix pencil and they, uh, you know, I know I would this because I worked in this a lot. I, I don't know why people like stop here and not consider this more general problem. Um, but one of the things that I that was always a little bit confused about is I can write it once I use this type of uh, relation, I guess I can make it into a general shift. It's like, T plus M is X to, the, X to the M times C of T. So you can write down all sorts of polynomials. That, what's the, so what's a good polynomial to form? So then I go back to this Vandermann system and its solution. I can easily promote all of these uh, uh, scalar elements to uh, Hermitian matrices. So now I can easily use this form to generate the, what I think is the right polynomial that you should study. But now I'm back to the same issue that I've got all of these solutions and somehow I want to try and find the physical ones. And so I've been wondering, is this, is, you know, a lot of times, and, and oftentimes the ones that you don't want are some high frequency ones anyways, and what you're really interested in is kind of the, the, the near null space of this. It, isn't there some kind of multigrid way that if I have these things that, that could help me solve this problem to try and identify what are the, the, the modes that look like they're you know, physical modes, nice falling exponentials, and that they're not uh, modes that are somehow fitting noise? Uh, and so that's another question. Is there 
some way that I can uh, help filter this system because, you know, if I just think of it as a black box, it's going to find the function, assuming I can find the roots of the polynomial, it's going to find the function that exactly fits all the data. And somehow, by finding the, that function and knowing its roots, I have to figure out which roots represent the noise and which roots represent the physical signal. And this is where I'm stuck and have been stuck for a while. So having lots of statistics helps because you can look at how the, you know, the, usually the noise ones move around and, and the, the physical ones stay flat. So that helps. And so maybe the only answer is just keep generating more lattices and computing more observables and then see which uh, state survive. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop there then. Okay, so that's um, what I think is uh, this, the current state of the, um, of the business uh, with respect to getting things out of two-point functions. A higher endpoint functions, there's related versions of this that you can write down. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, people say, people pretend, I think people tend to pretend in this business that they've got a better handle on, you know, how to extract these states, uh, you know, either by this matrix pencil form or by fitting. Uh, and... You know, maybe if it, it is a case that if you have enough statistics, it looks pretty stable, and then you can be pretty confident. But it also, we're sort of working with systems like, you know, if you're working with a system like uh, the Pion, uh, where the next state is so much higher, there's a big, huge gap. Uh, you know, your life could be a lot easier. But if you have a relatively dense and complicated spectrum, it's not clear uh, how easy it is to distinguish the noise, if you have noise mixed in with, with your uh, spectrum, or I, I guess you would say spurious states mixed in with your physical states. Um, also, it's very hard uh, from the point of view of if you're trying to do some resampling method to, to do an error analysis on these states. Oftentimes, uh, let's say you're doing a jackknife block or a bootstrap, so you're generating some synthetic ensemble from your original ensemble, but when you're solving these eigenvalue problems, maybe you're uh, just sorting the eigenvalues by magnitude. But on the different synthetic ensembles, the eigenvalues are uh, fluctuating up, you know, so that the, the ordering of the eigenvalues is changing. It becomes very hard to do the error analysis because you get a little bit confused about the identity of the state when their error bars overlap. You could say, well... If that's the case, then let's not look just at the magnitude of the eigenvalues, but let's look at the eigenvectors and see which direction they're pointing in, and that will uniquely identify a state. But there you have a similar problem. If I, again, try to do some kind of uh, either subsample, you know, divide my thing into subsamples to do an error analysis or, you know, bootstrap or something like that, the directions fluctuate. But also, not only that, when you're solving an eigenvalue problem, uh, uh, you know, you're free to flip the sign of the eigen, the, only the, the, the direct, I don't know, the direction doesn't matter, the, just the axis matters if you like. So uh, it can be a little bit confusing numerically to try and figure out uh, which label goes with which eigenvector. Uh, and you may say, well, I'm going to always flip. What, what people usually do is they say, I'm always going to look in the uh, matrix. Uh, and I'm going for a given eigenvector, I'm going to find the largest component and I'm going to make sure that one's always positive and try and fix the direction. Maybe, you know, you could various things. Try and find which axis is that vector closest to and then point it in the positive version of that. But then you have this problem that when and in your resampling method, that vector may, that component may get small and even change signs. So anyways, that's also a very hard problem that I haven't really... Uh, figured out how to handle, and it, it is related to this problem in the matrix pencil where, uh, you know, you have some state, you're orthogonalizing in this metric, but if you, if you think about how, you know, when I, if I'm orthogonalizing this metric and then I'm asking how that metric varies as I vary t, these vectors are moving around. 
So it, it, it may be very, and so you're trying to keep track of how a state varies as the metric itself varies, and you're trying to keep track of this relative angle so that I don't get the labels mixed up of who's who as I'm trying to study the T dependence of this. It can be very confusing if sometimes the labels get shifted around. So, so it's, it's tricky when you have new, either near degeneracy or near uh, of the eigenvalue or near degeneracy of the eigenvector. Uh, and I've seen all these problems. So um, anyways, OK, that's all I wanted to say. Any questions? No, you get uh, you don't get nt. Uh, actually, you don't. You just get so normally. If you think about an effective mass plot, you uh, you know you you have a pair t and t plus one, and you get the value of the effective mass as a function of you know where you put that pair. So you get the many different versions of the same thing. Here, if I do all the time slices of one, I only get one number. I don't look, I mean, I don't get, uh, so like, for example, in if this version, let's not talk, bother with the matrix value co coefficients. Here, if I use all my time slices, I just get the complete spectrum. So for the ground state, I won't get the T dependence of the ground state. I just get the, gra the ground state as one of the roots of the polynomial. Yeah, if you, it's const it's like doing a, it's like finding a, the fit. I, I, if you want to think about it this way, it's like linear least squares, but it's an exactly constrained system. I have equal amount of data points and uh, parameters, and I'm making the curve exactly go through all the points. I have as much data. Yeah, there's there's no. Because I, if I give you the original data and ask you what the mass is, this transform gives me the mass, if you like. No, but your exponential is a model of the physics that you think is there. If you, well, if you don't do any constraints, it's the same as throwing the model away. No, it's not one exponential. Remember, I have all. Right. If you do a one-to-one -one transform, your model is not putting anything into your data. Right? It's just, it's just one I'm one. just transforming the data into the parameters of my model. Right. Yeah, the model is not giving you any advantage. It's just a transform. Yeah. Look, if there were no data, That's it would be the if there were no noise, it would be the exact thing that you would get from fitting. The only issue is is when I'm when I'm applying this to data with noise, the effect of the noise is being absor absorbed into model parameters. But it's very different from the use of the platform. It's a one, one map, right? Right. Then what you're trying to do is you're saying that in a single exponential, and you're trying to get the entire plateau with that single exponential. Therefore, the model is adding something to your data. No, but, the, but the model tells you you never have a single exponential. Okay. Yeah. There's no information whatsoever about what this model is. It's just a good representation. Oh, no, let me just say, I don't have to use all my data. Right? I can choose whatever polynomial I want. So this form, I by just saying, look, if I only want two time slices, I do two time slices, I get the matrix pencil. If I want to use three, I do three. I want to use four. It's a stencil. I slide it, I can slide it around. If I want, I can use it to exhaust my whole data set. 
by just adding more states. Yeah. So, well, th so one of the things that you, that's one of the things that you can do is like don't only use half your data, and then slide it the, the stencil around and see how it depends on where you put down your stencil. But the the thing that I don't like is that uh, is that it's no difference if I'm doing the well. One thing I do know is one thing that you probably shouldn't do is basically. Uh, whether you want to do generalized eigenvalue or uh, effective mass, extract an effective mass and then try and fit the plateau. To me, that uh, that's not right because that I know is a, is a, a not a, a, a least squares estimate of the actual mass. You better should just do a least squares fit to your data uh, because because if if you actually have enough data to fully reconstruct the correlations between all of the time slices uh, that you get in your effective mass plot, you'll see that there's really no more new information than you would get there already from one uh, pair of time slices. The data is so correlated usually over the range that you had fitting, you're not getting any new information. So you're fooling yourself by thinking you have n independent degrees of freedom in your plateau, you really don't. You don't get any change in the size of, right. You should just pick one of the time slices in your plateau at random, and that's your estimate, if you like. But it can also, well, I don't know, you could uh, falsely convince yourself. <laughs> But I would just say that the to me the matrix pencil is just an effective mass. Yeah. Only in this metric, but there's arbitrariness about which metric you choose. That's the whole point of the pencil. They're only orthogonal within the metric, but. The metric evolves as you move the time slice, so the orthogonalization evolves. And I mean, you can show, if you have the same thing, you could do the same thing. We don't need it, it doesn't need to be. A matrix. I mean, yeah. If I have a one correlation function with arbitrary statistics, I can extract. And if I have enough time slices, I can extract the whole spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You don't. Uh, no. Even just all I need is uh, two time slices. No. If I have a, um, if I, I can use. Uh, well, okay, I would say that. If I have the, let's start again with just a single correlation function, scalar correlation function. If I have infinite number of time slices and no errors, I can extract all the exponentials from a single correlator. What, what information, what additional information do I get out of having a matrix, uh, a matrix valued correlation function? I get more, I get independent information. It makes my life a little bit easier. But the, the method is no different. Uh, well, now this is what I get back to. These eigenvalues you get are you, you're trying to find the eigenvalues of a piece of the Hamiltonian. Fine. Well, I was just saying you're, okay, ask your question. For next time, I it's there, but <laughs> I want to teach you how to use it. Let's imagine that we had um, an exact Hamiltonian that was, you know, 80 by 80. Right. right? Now, it's true that um, you could calculate um, only the powers of the Hamiltonian and from that get the eigenvalues. Right. But of course, the other thing to do is to take the matrix and diagonalize it, right? Right. And so, you know, and if you had enough states, 
right, then on one time slice, you would get the matrix and you would diagonalize it, right? So these are clearly totally independent ways to get all of the eigenvalues. So what you want to do is have an overconstrained thing where you try to get as many elements of the matrix, that's the diagonalization, and as many time slices, so you're seeing powers of it. And both of those things, if you had complete knowledge of either of them, could give you all the eigenvalues, right? So the, but they're totally different ways to calculate the eigenvalues. Now, you don't have complete knowledge of either of them, right? So then you're trying to use this model, namely that it is a exponential of a Hamiltonian, <laughs> to get a constraint. And you want to use that constraint. That's the, I mean, you have, well, otherwise you're just data in and data out. It's, no, it's, if there were no errors, if there were no noise, yeah. that's what he said, it would just be data in and data out. The issue is, I've got a, the, the dominant problem here is the noise. Most of the data is noise, and the signal, I'm trying to filter the data to find what's the signal and what's okay, the noise. Right. But I wanted to, one other point, yeah. since you raised this question, as you say, let's pretend our system is a Hamiltonian system, and the Hamiltonian is of dimension 80, but uh, I can instead only construct some piece of the Hamiltonian. Let's say it's 79 by 79. I extract the eigenvalues of that block of the Hamiltonian. What is the relationship between the eigenvalues that I extract and the actual Hamiltonian eigenvalues that I want? They're not the one-to-one. -one. This is exactly the interlacing theorem. The nice part, if I, it only differs by one, then I know that whatever eigenvalue I li have lies between uh, two, a pair. However, that's great if it only differs by one. If it's 80 by, if I have an 80-dimensional Hamiltonian and my uh, sub-block is 20, let's say, now I know that my ground state lies somewhere between the ground state of the original Hamiltonian and the 60th eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So in fact, when as the subblock that we're estimating the Hamiltonian gets smaller and smaller, that the 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 interlace the generalization of the interlacing theorem doesn't help you. What helps you is the exponential projection. So the reason why we look at the separation is because it makes it a heck of a lot easier to pick out to relate the eigenvalues of this. Uh, state to the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so, so now I have a, a, a complete a math problem, which is essentially what okay. I'm trying to get at. Suppose I have a, a 80 by 80 uh, Hamiltonian, right? And then I look at it projected onto a small set of vectors, say 20 by 20, right? But I do it for, I don't know, I think an arbitrary number, 30 different powers of the Hamiltonian, right? If I know all the powers, if I knew 80 powers of the Hamiltonian, even just a trace, I'd get everything, right? <laughs> just even one matrix element, right? On the other hand, if I have all matrix elements, I don't need any powers, right? So here's a complete math problem. If I've got a combination of both, which is basically what you're doing, how do I use that information best? And I think that's, to me, what the issue yeah. is here, right? I yeah. mean, your model is that it's power, well, it's actually powers of e to the T Hamiltonian, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing, it's still a Hermitian matrix. Yes, yes, still. So, so what you've got is these two different pieces of information on this, now I'm making it finite, just to make it a, a clean math problem. I can see James Brandick is about to solve it. No? no? <laughs> but, you, but you see the question. I mean, that's the question, I think, right? And, uh, and then, of course, you've add noise to it, it becomes even more interesting. Yes, but, right. okay. but even as just a math problem without noise, it's a question of what is the best way to use these two different ways to determine the eigenvalues. Right, a bigger submatrix of the Hamiltonian and more, more powers more, of that submatrix, but it's powers of the submatrix, right, so, not the whole Hamiltonian. You could write this now down as a nice artificial problem for next QCDNA, right? You can take a <laughs> toy, and you can take so many powers and so many uh, matrix elements, and then you could add so much noise, and you could ask, what is the right way to use these two different kinds of constraints to get the best possible thing? Actually, all, right. all, all when you want the small eigenvalues makes it even more interesting, okay? But I think that's the problem. And I, good. And I don't, you, you reformulated I don't it in a good way. Okay. So I know, and <laughs> so that's the problem for you to solve next time. I have one okay. more problem for next time. All right. Because, you know, uh, I think you probably got too much time on your hands. Uh, <laughs> no, it's the problem you started with, uh, which was to find the Higgs state, means that the model, uh, I don't really know the answer to this, so it's really a question, maybe for everybody. 
the model you probably really have to get into is you're looking for a state which is higher than the 2 pi threshold. Right. Right? Because you're going to have a, 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 a continuum. I mean, more than that, but at least you're going to have the Higgs, the sigma, going at the two pi's. It's lower than the state you're trying to find, right? <laughs> and now your model, of course, is no longer the model that you wrote down, although in a finite box it's still a finite number of states because of discrete momentum. Yes. It's kind of that, okay? But nonetheless, you have a model now, but those, that momenta, those states are very correlated. You know a lot about them. They're not just an, even in a finite box. I mean, Lucier tells you what that finite box of excitations is for the two pions, okay? Well, well, he tells you, how, he, given you know the spectrum in a finite box, he tells you how to relate it to the, well, the scattering length. But even in a free problem, you know, you know what two, you know what two free, you know, momentum p1, p2, and discrete times, you know what it, that continuum is, right? Yeah, you can, this is, you, you would say, I would say it a different way. We know that there's a spectrum. Right. Pieces of the spectrum vary as we vary the box size. Right. So anyway, so the problem I'm asking is how do you find best the first bound state? Actually, it's not even really quite bound below a two-party, which is higher than a two-particle threshold. But that is exactly yeah. Lucher's method. Yeah. Well, I By studying the volume dependence of the low spectrum, but you need no, no, but any I'm, toy model you do, you need like no, the no, first five energy to, levels to do I'm it to uh, rely on. From his method, but from your correlator method. Well, my correlator method just tells you how to get the levels. Then you have to analyze the volume dependence of the levels no, to but there's, identify there's the physics resonance. to put in that you know what you've got below this. Is it yeah, I mean, same? whether you're saying there's a better model function better to use. Model, I'm maybe, maybe. Or at least there's more. Anyway, so that's the next. What? What? Well, I mean, you know, we basically know what it is. It's a vertex that goes to two particles, and we can write down a Feynman diagram, and then we can put it on the lattice and discrete times. We can do. We can certainly know a model for that thing, which is much different than just saying it's. We don't know what it is. Actually, it has specific volume dependence because as the volume dependence goes, the state levels change. I mean, there's a lot of information by assuming this very simple statement that there's only two particles. Well, I think. People are trying to do that, like in particular in dealing with thresholds yes. in this looser yeah, yeah. method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But from the lattice point of view, all we have a box, all we see is a spectrum. All we can do is create sources with quantum numbers and look at the spectrum that we get. It's how you get the state out. I don't know if you, yeah, once you've got that information, then it's modeling to try and back out okay, the other Anyway, stuff. I leave that for the next Any more questions? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, finding the roots of a polynomial numerically, I think, is a hard problem. Although, the good thing is there are solvers. There are packages out there. You can just give it a polynomial, and it solves it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you guys have an opinion about... Right. So it's... Um, Right. It's, I don't know. I mean, that's what I do. I, uh, I stick it into a package uh, and find all the eigenvalues. The, the usual problem is figuring out, now I've got all of these uh, roots of the polynomial, and I know 90% of them are junk uh, or less. I mean, maybe I'm only interested in the first. I want to find out of 100 roots, three or four. But it's the same thing when you're doing this. You know, let's say I'm calling Morningstar and I've got a, a 1024 by 1024 correlator matrix and all I want is the three energy levels. You know, I've got this gigantic matrix, most of which is noise, and I somehow want to find the three lowest energy levels in that state. How do I sort, how do I filter that? So it's a kind of filtering problem. You know that you're generating all sorts of solutions that are noise, and how do you get rid of them? How do you distinguish the signal and the noise? Yeah. Um, in the uh, I think if you're going to start fitting, then the bet what and this is the way when I do uh, the way I do all this now is this whole machinery is usually at the end of the day fed in as initial guesses into some nonlinear least squares fitter that is designed to be stabilized for this exponential kind of problem. 
So at the end of the day, I want to get rid of all of this uh, complaints about your fitting noise by actually putting it into some least squares fitter. But the problem with those least squares fitter, for this exponential time series problem, they do not converge very well unless you get very close to the right answer to begin with. So this is a way, if you like, to get the initial guess for your least squares fitter. Uh, well, I do a least. I can do a least squares fit to uh, uh, today to this. No, I don't want to fit these models after, as Rich says. I could think of this as just doing a, a transformation, not linear, a transformation on my data that transforms data into these model parameters and fit the model parameters. That is, I do, do never think that's a good idea. I want to find an initial guess for my nonlinear solver that will give it a good chance to converge by doing this transformation, solving this transformation, and then I want to stuff this in and fit this original raw data with the nonlinear least squares fitter. And usually a much smaller model space, because I'm only interested in the first three levels. You know, I usually very carefully add levels one at a time until I hit chi-square per degree of freedom of about one, and then I stop, because there's no point in adding additional model parameters at that point. Yep. So, Yeah, well, this, is this a multigrid problem or not? If I Right. Uh, which is essentially the same sort of thing, linear combinations of sources, right? And then gradually solving the coarser problem. Right. And then going back up. Right. And this way you would guide your fit, right? Or you well what this is this is one of the the are the state of the arts when this is a correlator matrix, you start out usually with a huge basis, uh, which in some sense is guaranteed to be uh, not linearly independent in the signal, but the noise could be awful. And so the issue is how to pair that huge matrix down to a relatively small matrix, which has great sig signal to noise uh, and, and, and overlaps most strongly with the, the low-lying states that you want. So. Right. Okay. If any ideas are welcome, but we should not go too long. Uh, oh, so now uh, we have coffee break, and then we come back in half an hour, and uh, I forget who's next. So if you're next, come down here so I can download your talk. Well, I haven't looked at the schedule. <laughs> I think it's either Ethan or Paolo. I can't remember who's next. Yes.
and Start in about five minutes. Uh, for those interested in lunch afterwards, it can stay for lunch afterwards and interested, uh, we'll go to for dim sum to Great Wall Chinese Restaurant, which is very close to the department. Uh, they have uh, excellent uh, dim sum. Uh, so, and other stuff too. But uh, let's see. So here we are in Sloan, and uh, this is Whitney, and this is uh, Prospect. You know, so most people go down this way, but uh, here's Sloan, and then there's a courtyard, and this is the, the, the big high rise, and then there's a big parking lot here, and then you just walk down Whitney, and then uh, Whitney Forks down here at Trumbull Street. It forks this way, and Great Wall is sort of there. Anyways, and so about, I guess, about a half an hour after uh, we break, I think we'll meet there. We probably don't have enough people that it's worth making reservation. They have big tables there, and we can just go and sit. So, but uh, uh, can I get a show of hands of about how many would be interested for going for dim sum afterwards? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, good. Well, maybe it's big enough I should call them so that I'm sure we get a table. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, you could always walk or I could drive you or uh, I'm just trying to think. There's a free, so from the green, from the village green, there's a free city shuttle. There's a, um, there's a, Maypong, what's the Yale bus that goes there? Weekend Blue. Yeah, I don't know, maybe Maypong knows the bus. Yeah, I mean, if we, if, right, I have a car too, so, are you taking off? Okay, good, good, yeah, let's be in touch. Thank, thanks for coming. Good. So, uh, right. There are shuttle ways to get to the train station. In principle, you could walk too, but good. And I could drive somebody to the train station. Okay. What's that? I'm going to the train station. All right. All right. So we're going to flip the order of the talks um, because Ethan's talk, because uh, some of the things that Ethan's going to talk about, I re referred to. Uh, in my talk, so it seemed sensible to flip them, and Paolo was it, it okay with that. So uh, now we'll have uh, Ethan uh, from uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, and also jointly with uh, uh, Riken BNL Research Center, uh, which is uh, across the, pond, the the sound in Brookhaven, and uh, talking about uh, same similar kind of thing: how to do parameter estimation from the data you get off of lattice simulations. Uh, but this from a Bayesian approach. All right, thank you. This thing sounds like it's working. Uh, so I guess as most of you know, I was actually George's student. This is a uh, homecoming for me to Yale. Uh, and one of the things that George definitely turned me on to, to thinking about uh, was these sort of data analysis problems, multi-exponential fits, and this sort of thing. Um, I've heard repeatedly this, this workshop's very informal, so this talk will be sort of presenting a couple of Semi-related ideas along those lines. Feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, as we go. All right. So what am I going to talk about? I'll just go, go through a couple of basics about the, the idea behind doing uh, Bayesian analysis uh, for this problem. And then I'll talk some about fitting correlation functions uh, using the Bayesian approach. Uh, I'll start with the, the idea of so-called constrained curve fitting, which is sort of what a lot of people use in this direction. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, what I've been doing along those lines, 
uh, which I'm calling two-stage constraint fitting, uh, which is sort of approaching a, a more black box way to look at it. Uh, and then I'll go on to a topic which is sort of related, which is goes beyond just the idea of if we have some data set and we want to fit multi-exponentials to it. Uh, I, if we're given a model, how do we extract the parameters? I want to go further and say if we really don't know exactly what the model is, and this is very common uh, in lattice data analysis, if we have uh, where everything's sort of described by effective field theories, you have in principle higher and higher terms you can add in. You really want to say, where should I stop? How do I really analyze things consistently uh, as far as how many terms I'm including? So I'm going to talk about a Bayesian way to think about that. So uh, I'm not here to start a, a war about the use of Bayesian versus frequency statistics. Uh, I'm using Bayesian methods here just to be clear, mainly as a numerical tool, uh, sort of to enforce stability. And I'm using them as a formal framework. I'm going to invoke Bayes' theorem, which hopefully we can all agree on, uh, to derive some useful formulas. Uh, but everything I want to talk about here is, should be more or less applicable, independent of what your personal preference is for how strong your prior information uh, should be when you go into an analysis like this. And of course, uh, I am a physicist. I'm not a statistician. If anyone's closer to being a statistician, feel free to stop me if I say something egregious. All right. So again, a lot of the context for what I'm going to say here is given by Bayes' theorem up here at the top. So if I have two events, A and B, the probability of A times the probability of B given A is equal to the converse over here. Um, in the context, that's the general statement, in the context of what we want to talk about, which is having some data set, some set of observations, and fitting them to a model, uh, M. This is usually written this way. Uh, so there are four terms here that have sort of uh, different names that people like to use. So the probability of the model, given the data, is what we're trying to extract. This is what we're trying to, to use to determine estimates of the model parameters. This is usually called the posterior, or the evidence. Uh, probability of the data given the model is the likelihood. That's what we get from least squares from the chi-square function. Uh, probability of the model itself is what we call the prior information. That's what we know about the model before we get, even look at the data. And then this factor down here, I don't even know the name for it. Maybe someone does, but it's usually, this just, uh, in practice, is just a sort of an overall normalization, so people tend to ignore that. OK. So just to remind everyone, so we're on the same page, what do we do when we fit a model uh, with least squares? Well, so for now, I'm just going to say I have one, one model, capital M, and I'm going to say it's described by as in a function with some set of model parameters I'll call A, uh, which I'm trying to extract, trying to optimize. So we do least squares minimization. To find the best fit, uh, we construct this chi-square statistic, which is just the difference between if I have a simple data set uh, uh, just a set of points x and y, and I have some error bar sigma on the points y, then this is the chi-square statistic, uh, just the deviates of the data from the model normalized by the error bars. And this determines that likelihood function uh, that, I, that I gave you on the last slide. The likelihood is just proportional to e to the minus chi-squared over 2. Uh, so to maximize the likelihood of the data given the model, we just minimize chi-squared. So that's how it works in practice. Um, in Bayesian terms, we can find we can determine not just the actual best fit point, but all the model parameters, any expectation values of functions of them, so the mean, the, the variance, and so forth. Uh, and they're all determined by this posterior PDF by just integrating over it in this way. And if we assume that the prior function, that we don't, if, if we don't want to do anything with the prior function for now, we just ignore it, uh, then this, this function here is just proportional to the likelihood, so this is just uh, equivalent to integrating over e to the minus chi squared. Uh, so with no priors then any, or, or anything like that, then this description sort of lines up nicely with the usual uh, frequentist description. All right, so those are the basics. Now I want to come back to the, uh, the problem that we've been discussing, which is multi-exponential fits. So, and that's, we're just trying to model the data, uh, some correlation function, for example, uh, C of t, and we want to model it with this, a function of this form where we have a sum of several exponentials, 
uh, which decay with some some amplitude or some energy E in the exponential and some amplitude out in front A. And so there's an immediate and simple source of instability that you have to try to that you have to worry about in fitting something of this form, which is just an ordering ambiguity. Uh, so even if I have in the actual data, I know that's described by some set of physical states and they have some set of energies that are nice and well ordered. Uh, the fitter, the function doesn't know that if I just write it in this simple form. Uh, nobody says that the first label here has to be the ground state energy, the, the smallest uh, E. And so this distribution, if I don't do anything else to it, sort of has n factorial minima in it. And it's very easy for your optimizer. If, you don't, if you're not careful, it's very easy for your, uh, your minimization of the chi-squared function to sort of wander off and get lost in this space with many minima. Um, you can make a lot of progress uh, in fixing this by using just a mapping. So you just rewrite your, your fit function in some way, which enforces uh, physical constraints on it or enforces some kind of ordering. For example, here, instead of actually fitting these energies individually, I use as my, my parameters uh, for the model the first energy and then the logs of the differences of the energies uh, with, with each subsequent higher state. And so that removes most of those spurious minima from the, the probability distribution and, and then but just by forcing the, the states to be ordered in a certain way. Uh, it leaves one ambiguity behind. Um, if I have too many states in the fit, if the sum is over too many terms, which is just that the fitter can still attempt to model the data by basically zeroing out the first state and then replacing the second state, the, the first with the second and the second with the third and so on. Uh, so I have a picture of that happening. So for example, this is a log, a log plot here. The red points are just some artificially generated uh, sum of exponentials, C of T. And I have some set of three states, blue, green, and orange, which when I sum them up add up to uh, do a good job of describing this data. But of course, I don't have really great resolution on the third state here. It's only sort of contributing appreciably way, way up at the top of the, uh, the function here. And so it's easily, it, you can easily imagine that if I, depending on how I start off my optimization, uh, I could end up in a spurious minimum where this happens, where what was the ground state, the dominant state out here at large t, uh, has its amplitude basically reduced and just contributes almost nothing everywhere here as replaced by the green state, the second one, and then the orange one ends up replacing what was green. And so I end up with almost as good a fit uh, but I've sort of knocked this, this first fit out. And again, this is an ordering ambiguity. And if I try to ask, well, what is the, what is the best fit value? What is the error bar on the energy, the ground state energy, so the slope of this blue line, I will get confused. I will get bad answers because it's, um, my fitter is going to be trying to average over these two possibilities in some way. OK. So we can do a little more to try to prevent something like that from happening. And this comes to the idea of constrained curve fitting, uh, which is in this paper by Peter Lepage and company from 2001. And that lets us actually incorporate this prior information. So actually put P of M to use. So we replace our original chi-squared function with what they call an augmented chi-squared function, where you add in some additional uh, constraints. You add in this, this prior chi-squared function um, so if a, j are the parameters that go into my model, then I pick some mean value and some width for the prior, for the Gaussian prior, which are these things in tilts, and I just have a Gaussian probability distribution that keeps the, the fit parameters sort of within that range, or, or gives you a penalty if they wander away from the values that you, you specify there. And again, this is just... These probability distributions goes e to the minus chi squared. So this is this sum is just multiplying these two things together as as prescribed by uh, Bayes' the, Bayes' theorem. So uh, this can work pretty well in certain examples. What you can do by constraining things in this way is you can add um, a large number of higher and higher states, and things will stay very numerically stable. Uh, this is a plot from their paper showing that they add they go up to eight a sum of eight exponential terms, and this is just their results for what they're interested in, the first two energies 
uh, for fitting to some correlator. And it sort of quickly, uh, after you add a few terms, it converges to a stable result. And then adding more and more exponential terms with these prior constraints sort of removes the flat directions in the probability space that your fitter can wander off into uh, and keeps things nice and stable. Um, the big question if you're doing something like this, of course, is how do you set these priors? How do you determine what the mean values and what the widths are? Uh, in principle, these things are, our energies are really masses of physical particles. So maybe, you know, maybe if you're doing QCD, you can look in the PDG and have some idea. Uh, of course, in a lattice simulation, there's lots of other little contributions that can change things. You're probably not going to be able to really set your prior constraints from real experimental data in most cases. Uh, in practice, a lot of people will do this just by looking at some subset of the data and seeing what these, these energies look like and then set the, uh, set the priors based on that. So at this level, it, it can be more of an art than, uh, than a science in some extent. But again, you really, what you want to do, you don't want these to really change your fit result appreciably. You just want these to give you numerical stability. So it doesn't matter too much exactly how you, you decide to set these things. It can be, it's just sort of a pain and sort of an ad hoc practice to do it uh, by looking at a subset of the data. And there's no real good prescription for how to do that. But as long as these widths are, are large enough that you're not really biasing the actual fit, you're just imposing stability. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. And there are other options uh, to deal with this multi-exponential stability, of course. Uh, most of these problems, uh, when I say there's a problem with numerical stability, I just mean you're trying to optimize this chi-squared function. You're trying to find the minimum, and you numerically wander off in the wrong direction uh, in your parameter space. And you can address that if you just carefully, if you tune the initial conditions carefully enough. If your guess is close enough to the actual minimum you're looking for, you always converge. Uh, that's not really, it's, it's sort of nice to be able to do that, but you kind of need to know the right answer in advance. Uh, and especially if you're doing something like a bootstrap or jackknife procedure where you're replicating the data over and over, it's not practical to be able to, to set the initial conditions carefully enough. Um, there's some. There are other alternatives. You can do sort of sequential fits where you do some fit to a small range of the data where everything is stable and described by, say, one state. And, every, and it's easy to describe. And then you sort of fix the parameters and step down, add more data piece by piece, and try to just sort of, sort of uh, make sure that the minimum is only moving slightly. As you repeat the analysis, uh, that can work well in some cases. Sort of requires doing a lot of, a lot of fitting, so a lot of numerics. Uh, there's the approach where having multiple effective masses or looking at these van der Moen polynomials. We heard about that this morning. There's probably other alternatives I've forgotten. Uh, so a lot of people have tried to, uh, to sort of resolve this. So I've been thinking about this in terms of these constrained fits uh, for analysis I've been working on in the past couple of years. And I noticed that. In cases where I ran into numerical instability, it was mostly because of what I showed you, because of something being off with the ground state. As long as you have uh, a number of states that are sort of well-ordered, as long as you have these constraints that keep, you, that, that keep the, the extra exponentials you're adding from wandering off in some, some bizarre on physical direction in, in the parameter space, as long as you fix the ground state, everything works pretty well. And as I said, a lot of people use sort of a data-driven approach in some sense, where they look at the data to fix these priors that go into the constrained uh, fits. And so my idea was, why not just do that explicitly? So just look at the correlation function itself and use it to constrain the ground state parameters. So the idea is to start with what a lot of people are familiar with in these analyses. You, you, look at, you identify a plateau region in your correlation function. So look at an effective mass plot, look for it to be flat. So you know the data there is dominated by one state. Uh, and you do a fit. You do a small fit there, uh, a, a fit with one state in it. Uh, and you use that to estimate the ground state parameters. And then you use those as an input to a constrained fit on the whole data set. You set those priors I was talking about using the mean values from the plateau. Uh, the width you can set to some multiple of the, the uncertainty you get from your fit from the plateau. Again, it doesn't have to be too tightly constrained. You're, just, you're trying to eliminate numerical instability. 
I think this, in principle, you can probably adapt this to a black box method. The only real human input you're doing uh, that you need here is going through and identifying this plateau region. You could imagine trying to set up some sort of uh, automatic plateau finder that would that would turn this method into a complete black box for you. Um, So you, you fit the ground state out in the plateau where, you, where that's dominant. And then you use that as, as you set the priors from that. And then do the full fit to, to all the data. Um, in principle, you don't have to inflate these error bars. You could, pro you could really, if the data were not correlated with each other, you could really do these two fits separately and set the prior widths to one. It would really be prior information you could input into the other fit. Uh, I don't know at this point how to do this rigorously if the data are correlated, which they, they of course, always are in a lattice correlator correlation function. Um, as long as you're only using this for numerical stability, you just set it to a multiple and you don't, you don't care. You're not really double counting anything because you're only using this to stabilize things, not to add statistical information. So, and I've, I've tested this uh, numerically, sort of extensively. So here's just a plot of an effective mass uh, from Fermilab milk data that I've been working on. And so I identify some plateau region out here, let's say, and this is the result. Uh, this is the ground state energy resulting from a fit to this region. And then I set the priors to whatever result I get out here, scaled up by some factor n. I think in practice I've been using a factor of three. Uh, it doesn't and it shouldn't depend on exactly what factor you use. And then I just fit the entire correlation function using this as an input with however many excited states I need. And I, again, this is nice and numerically stable, so all I have to do is, is add a large number of excited states so that I get a good, a good fit, a good chi-square to the whole correlator fit. Yeah? So those, those you still have to set. Um, in principle, you could do something like this, where instead you go out further and you fit, say, the first excited state, and you use that as priors. Um, I just set them to something very broad. Um, I find that the, the excited states, again, for numerical stability, don't have to be constrained as tightly as the ground state. So I'll, I'll have some prior on it, so the amplitude can't go very close to zero, uh, so the energies don't blow up, but it doesn't matter that much. And the real, the real gain here is, is especially for, not just for finding the fit, but for using these methods where you're replicating the data. So using something like jackknife or bootstrap. And I'll show you here um, the results for, these are data covariants uh, determined between, so, so I should say these data are all derived from one lattice ensemble, but I, they're measured at 14 different valence masses. Uh, so all of these correlation functions, all these correlators are highly correlated with each other. And I want to extract the covariance from some bootstrap procedure between these ground state energies. And the left side shows what, what happened if I did this without this two-stage method. And you can see there's some blob up here uh, where the best fit is supposed to live. But the, the actual bootstrap replication, somehow, sometimes the fitter would wander off numerically. Uh, probably something like what I was showing you before, where the ground state is being set to zero and the other states replace it. And this just completely ruins the, the distribution I'm trying to extract here. This is a plot, this is a heat map of the, the actual correlation coefficient that I get from this ensemble. And you can see, as you'd expect from this upper plot, uh, you're sort of losing a lot of the information, the correlations you expect to be uh, on the off diagonals or on the near diagonals here are lost in a lot of cases, just by this numerical instability. And then when I turn to this two-stage method, when I really constrain the ground state tightly using this plateau fit, then I get uh, a nice looking set of bootstrap samples with a clear uh, correlation between them. And the overall global correlation matrix looks good. Yeah, so the plateau. The, so I don't. I don't think it would be right to redo the plateau to reset the priors for every bootstrap replication. So yeah, I do that once. I do the plateau fit once to set the priors, and then those single priors are used for each replication. Oh, you don't redo the 
redo the prior presentation? No. Okay. That, that's not necessary. All right, I, I'm going to go to my second topic, which is model selection, uh, unless there's any more questions about the, the, first, the first part of my talk. OK. Um, so as I said at the beginning, if we're going to do parameter estimation, we really need a choice of model that we're going to fit to the data. And very often in lattice analysis, this is not as clear cut as you would hope. Um, in basically everything that we do, so continuum extrapolation, uh, in trying to, to do chiral extrapolation so to fit the mass dependence, and in these multi-exponential fits, you have no idea really how many terms you need to include. The model is an effective field theory. In principle, there's a, there's a formally infinite number of terms that you can add in uh, of higher and higher order that are suppressed by some parameter, by some expansion parameter, but they're still, uh, you still don't know a priori exactly where you need to truncate the expansion. So how do we decide? And more importantly, if we do just truncate this somewhere, what is the error we make in doing so? So, and people wrestle with this problem, and there's different ways to deal with it. Uh, a common approach is just to pick a reasonable stopping point, what you think is reasonable by looking at the data. Uh, for example, you have a chiral fit. You do it to next to leading order, and you drop all the higher terms. And then say you go, well, all right, I want to make sure. So I go one step further. I go to next to next to leading order. I redo the fit. And then whatever difference I see between the higher order fit and my main one, the one I picked as my favorite, uh, I take that to estimate the, the systematic error, even if they're sort of equally good descriptions of the data. Um, I think that's OK. I think that's likely even a conservative approach to estimating what the real effect of doing this is uh, if these fits are as good as each other. Uh, taking this, the central value difference is probably too conservative, but you can do this. Uh, some people have tried um, a less conservative approach, which is to try to do multiple fits like this and then combine them in some weighted way. Say, all right, these fits have certain p-values. I'm going to weight them by the p-values and combine them. That's less conservative. Is that really the right thing to do? Um, I've never seen a rigorous justification of that, but I'll sort of talk about that in the Bayesian approach here. Um, we can always just appeal to the physical ideas of effective field theory and naturalness and just say, all right, we're, we know what coefficients we're missing. We just assume they're all order one uh, and try to estimate how big the, the systematic error we're making is based on that. Uh, we can all disagree on what exactly order one means is the problem with that. Um, you know, should we put in one or two, or should we try to, to marginalize to sum over it in some way? So what I'm going to try to argue is that these Bayesian methods can give you uh, a nice, rigorous way to, to deal with all this. And this is what I'm going to talk about is based on this archive paper, uh, which is doing some of these sa the same things here for effective field theory, not on the lattice. So say we have some set of nested models, like, say, an effective field theory where we're dropping some terms like this. And I'm going to divide the, the set of parameters that describe the model. I'm going to call A again, but I'll divide it into some common parameters, uh, A res, residual ones, and additional parameters, uh, which I want to marginalize over. So if I do this, then I know what the probability distribution for the parameters given the data is, uh, just based on applying Bayes', Bayes theorem. Uh, and some basic probability is just given by marginalizing now not only over these parameters that I don't care about, uh, a marginal, but also over the models. So if I have now some set of models M that are nested, I just have to sum over all of them. And so this is a this relates the probability of one to the other. Uh, we know what all these probabilities are over here on the right hand side. This is pretty much what we already were looking at. Uh, at the beginning from Bayes' theorem. This is the likelihood up here, so this is e to the minus chi squared. These are priors that we have to set in some way. And we really, again, having these priors in this case, I think, is, is very important uh, to avoid runaway numerics, because you, you're adding in higher and higher order terms that you're going to marginalize over. Um, I should point out, I didn't write it in this formula, but you can, you can adapt this to also marginalize over what you mean by order one. Uh, which is a nice sort of innovation here. 
So if I set the priors on these higher order terms to say, you know, it's a Gaussian prior, the width is one or two or something, I can actually do an integral or a sum over what I set the width to, and in that way I can I can make it insensitive to exactly what naturalness criterion I'm picking. Okay. So that formula, that sort of master formula, is all I need to show some interesting results and to show um, if I want this thing that I'm interested in, again, is the expectation value of some function of the parameters, so the mean, the error bar, covariance, whatever you want, uh, over this entire family of models is just given by this sum. And it turns out to be pretty simple. It's just the expectation value of the same function within a particular model weighted by this factor, by the evidence. So this is, the, you, this is kind of close to what some people have already done in the literature where you sum weighted by the likelihood of the model, or by the p-value of the model, uh, except that these Bayes factors are not the same thing as a frequentist p-value. Uh, they're just statistically different. So it's a little, it's a little spurious to do it that way. Uh, but this way, uh, I think, is, sort of, is well justified. And this evidence factor just requires computing this integral over the likelihood. Again, we know exactly what this function is on the right-hand side. We just have to integrate it now over the entire parameter space uh, to find out what the evidence factor for the model is. So this is a very common thing uh, for anyone who does Bayesian analysis in any different field. There's a lot of different methods on the market for estimation of this integral. Uh, some are better for different problems. I'm not really sure yet what the best way to do this is for uh, the sort of problems we encounter in lattice analysis. Uh, I'm open to suggestions. What would be particularly nice and what we're sort of familiar with already uh, in practice is some kind of Markov chain Monte Carlo approach where you would do some important sampling of this integral. Uh, that might be particularly nice because you can, once you have the sampling of this distribution, you can compute, you can use it to compute any of these expectation values after the fact that you want. You can sort of use the procedure you use to get the best fit uh, to do all of this marginalization and everything. So it would be particularly nice to have some approach like that. Let me just show you how this works in pictures in a very, very simple example. So I have three data points uh, up there on the top left, and I just want to extrapolate to zero. And I don't know a priori whether the functional dependence is constant or is linear. And you can sort of see with those error bars, I've actually drawn it from a linear model, uh, but with the error bars, you can see it's sort of ambiguous. So I take the approach that I, I want to fit both models. I want to marginalize. And so in these two columns are my individual fits. M equals 0 uh, is the constant fit, is this red bar uh, with error band. M equals 1 is the linear fit. And I get two different estimates for what the intercept actually is. Constant 1 favors a higher one. Linear 1 has a bigger error bar. Um, and in this simple example, I can just do the integral in Mathematica to, to estimate what the evidence is for each of these things. I don't need a Markov chain. Uh, so these are the evidence factors. Uh, I also include the chi-squared that you get and the p-values. Uh, just for reference, you can see the p-values are not the same thing as the Bayesian evidence. They're sort of correlated in the sense that a really bad fit will have both low, a low evidence factor and a very small p-value, but they're, they're really, they're not quite the same thing. And so I do this combination procedure. I just do a weighted sum of these. If I want to know what A0 is, uh, marginalizing over my choice of model, I just do a weighted sum weighted by these, these evidence factors for both the mean and for the error bar, and this is what I get. And th these are the actual prob probability distributions corresponding to this, uh, just so you can see. That's just sort of taking the, the left edge of this plot here. Uh, so green is the, the linear one, red is the constant, and you, you can see what you get when you do this weighted sum is this black sort of funny shaped probability distribution, which is the joint probability uh, marginalizing over your choice of model here. I should say this is, this is less conservative. You get a smaller error on this result. I still trustworthy, but you get a smaller error than you would if you were doing sort of the old fashioned approach where I just say, okay. I'll take the difference in the means of these two things as my estimate of the, the systematic error between the model choices. So it's a little more precise to do it this way, as you'd expect. OK. 
Um, there's caveats to this procedure, which are important to mention. Uh, combining these things like this in the first place assumes that my statistical picture here is right. Uh, in particular, if you have autocorrelations in your data, then you're going to estimate that your chi-squared estimates are going to be wrong, your p-values and your evidence will be wrong, uh, and you'll sort of try to add them with the wrong weights. So it's very important to deal with autocorrelations uh, and if issues with your data like that uh, before you turn to this procedure. Uh, it's not entirely clear, but I'm thinking about it, what happens if you try to include sort of a pathological, like a bad model in your set of models, something that has some spurious behavior uh, or a divergence or something like that near the point you're trying to get to. Um, something else I want to think about is whether we can use this approach to deal with something with, with a multi-exponential FIST, just coming back to that as well. I gave you an example of something that would be like a continuum extrapolation. Um, but in principle, you can marginalize over, over something else that people commonly use in practice, which is to cut the data off uh, look at the data in some range, t min and t max, for a, a correlation function, and just fit to that. And it, you know if you've done these fits in practice, you can adjust t min and t max slightly. You can change the range slightly, and you'll get estimates that are sort of close to each other. And there's a whole art in actually picking what you're going to use, where you're going to cut the data off to try to describe it. And I think, I think it's possible, in principle, to do some marginalization over those cutoffs as well in this, in this Bayesian approach. Uh, which might be sort of give some clarity to thinking about that, but I'm not sure. Uh, actually, dividing the data set up like that, it's not clear at this point how you do that in this framework. It, it would be interesting to think about in the context of chiral perturbation theory as well, for example, which is another, another example where you really want to uh, sort of play with the range of data that you fit to. OK. Uh, I'm going to stop there with sort of the, the blue sky open questions and uh, open it for discussion. See, okay. uh, any questions uh, for Ethan? OK, so I had a question. I mean, with the Markov chain Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess, oh, you're going to have an example. I, I, OK. Yeah, I guess the, the, the main thing is um, how does it work when you're trying to actually do the integration? Uh, how does it uh, usually you you may you may be trying I guess it's maybe it's just like we do in a lattice calculation. You just basically keep generating data and by an important sampling method eventually you just get a better and better estimate of this integral. Yeah, I mean you want to I mean you know how precisely you have to estimate the integral, which is more precisely than your the actual errors you're getting from the data are right? right. You don't want to introduce any extra error into your your uh, final results by based on doing the integral. It is very similar, I think, to the kind of integrals we do on the lattice. You know, it's very very sharply peaked because it's e to the minus chi squared, basically. Yeah, I'm wondering how um, how much you have to probe the tails. Uh, I mean, do you get into a situation where if you have uh, you know, two models that, you know, overlap somewhat, but in the tail, and somehow you, if you don't sample the tail very well enough, you don't get the joint probability distribution right. Or maybe that doesn't matter because that's not a big contribution to the integral. So I, I, Yeah, I think in general, again, it's very sharply peaked, so you don't have to worry too much about the tails. If you have two model possibilities that are sort of close to each other, you want to make sure you sample everything there okay. where it's sharply peaked. but. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think it converges pretty quickly. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, good. Um, all right, so let's uh, then keep going. Uh, let's thank Ethan. Good. And then our uh, final talk of the day is uh, Paulo da Silva from Coimbra in Portugal. Uh, let's see. And we may actually be, wow, our lunch reservation is at 1, but maybe that's, uh, well, maybe we'll just go early. I don't think it would be a problem. Uh,
Okay. Uh, is your mic on? Is your mic on? Good. That's good. I'm off there. Good. All right. And for our last talk of the day, gluon spectral densities. Great. So this is a um, collaboration with the uh, so with the uh, um, colleague from uh, Ghent in Belgium, and. Uh, So uh, after a short introduction motivation, I will show you uh, a new method to compute the spectral density. We apply this for the Landau gauge gluon propagator. And um, also, I will show you some results at finite temperature, and that I will conclude. So the main goal here is to compute the spectral density of gluon and other physical or unphysical degrees of freedom. So in the context, in the context, in the context of um, uh, Dyson Swinger and Bitsaw Peter Spectrum studies, that uh, um, they need uh, the spectral density of the gluons. And uh, since the, the gluons are not part of the physical spectrum, they are due to confinement. Um, the spectral density is not strictly positive, and so the traditional maximum entropy method does not allow uh, the use of uh, to compute negative spectral density. So we aim it to try to find an, uh, another method that allows us to compute such uh, spectral densities. The method is explained in this paper that appeared recently, and I will closely follow this paper. So what, what we are interested in is in computing the spectral density given the propagator. On the lattice, people are used to, to study this uh, Temporal correlator define it this way. So um, this allows to, stu to, to study the violation of the positivity. So if you have a negative correlator, your uh, spectral density should be negative, or some, some if we, at least in some regions. So this uh, implies positivity violation and uh, gluon confinement. Note that even if you have a positive C, it says nothing about the, the signal of the petal density. So here you have a sample result for, the, for this function that I have shown here, this uh, temporal correlator, and you see the violation of positivity in this region, for example. So this is this has this uh, uh, property has been already observed in lattice simulations a long time ago, ten years ago. Yeah. Yes, I probably should notice. You say that if it's negative, it implies confinement. Hmm? Your your statement on the other transparency. Go back to the. So, you say if it's not positive, it can. It consists, if this is not possible, if you, if, the, if you have a negative CT for some regions of T, this quantity here should be negative because this is positive. So at some sense, you have, at least at some regions, you have a negative spectral density. And so the 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 gluon is not part of the, the of the physical spectrum. I guess I have to see how you define the the object later. Okay, I'll, I'll wait. So this has been a value of seven in lattice simulations. I think it was the first paper ten years ago about. Um, so 
generally speaking, if you have some uh, propagator in the, in the momentum space, in the Euclidean momentum space, a propagator of a scalar physical degree of freedom, you have you want to have a, a color lemma spectral representation with a positive uh, spectral density, and this spectral density contains information on the masses of the physical state described by this operator. Um, so you can write this definition here as a double Laplace transform. And so you want to invert this, this uh, uh, double Laplace transform. And this is a ill posed problem. So a possible way out that we have been working on is to use this uh, Tikhonov regularization. So suppose you have a ill posed problem this way. You try to minimize this quantity here, where lambda is a positive regularization parameter. And it is possible to, to prove that having a lambda, you have a unique solution. Note that this operator, kappa star, kappa plus lambda, is strictly positive. So you ought to have a solution. And uh, you can, there is some uh, Morozov discrepancy principle stating that you can choose your optimal lambda such that this this uh, this knob here is somewhat related to the noise of the input data that you are using in your um, in your propagator. So also a, a unique solution to this problem exists. Hmm? I don't understand. Why is G a double Laplace transform? If you do the, the calculation using this, uh, you get uh, you get this. You want to go from rho to G? No, I want to go from G to rho. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you want to go from rho to G, right? No, having the G. I want Where to go put the whole. Huh? The, the thing before I saw a single Laplace. Before I saw a single Laplace transform. Go back, go back. That's a single. There. C yes, but is this is if you have this temporal calculator, this integrator of the this integral of the of the propagator. Usually, you don't do you don't do, you don't do this. You have the the propagator, and uh, you want to. Having the propagator, you want to extract the row. I think G is what we have, and we want to get row. And yes. Is that a double the cost Where did they do? You, you can just do the, 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 the calculation. So if you if you apply this twice, you will be able to to get this uh, just mathematics. Can I go on? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to see the formula. So um, again, you have this. Uh, you have to impose. You, if you want to 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 try to get the spectral <laughs> density, you have to impose some uh, infrared resolve mu zero to avoid the singularity at the zero momentum. Uh, so on the lattice, uh, some numerical estimate, you usually have a discrete, a discrete set of n data points. So you have this information here. And you want to, to minimize this quantity here that I have defined before. You have this now explicitly in terms of, of the GI. So if you do some linear perturbation of this equation. So do, doing them some variation uh, and demanding, demanding the vanishing of the variation of this quantity, you get this equation. You can define this uh, integral here at, C, at the 
you can call this CI. So having this CI, you can invert, you can solve this in order to the spectral density. And you have this formula here. So plugging this formula in this equation here, you can have a closed equation for our CI parameters. And uh, you get this uh, equation in metric form for the CI, where your matrix M is given by this, just function of the momentum. In the diagonal elements are given by this, so this is a well perfectly well defined symmetric matrix for mu, uh, posit strictly positive mu. So you have reduced the inverse Kalanemer operation to solving this linear system, and notice also that you can reconstruct the propagator to check your solution by using this formula. So as a test to our method, we have considered this, uh, this time model given by this. So having your spectral density, you compute the propagator using the formula I showed before, and you test whether you can get again the, the spectral density. Uh, we have assigned to to our propagators some, uh, some errors with different magnitudes just to check what happens. So you have here your, your toy uh, spectral, de spectral density. So here you have the solutions for each uh, if each error that you consider with the different magnitudes, you can see that you reconstruct the propagator very well. So now we apply this method for the Landau gauge propagator. Uh, so from data, from lattice data, for the Landau gauge clone propagator on 80 to the 4 lattice at uh, using the Wilson gauge action at beta equal to 6.0, you get, so you have here the, the input propagator. You, if you, after getting this, uh, the gluon spectral functions, you can reconstruct the propagator and check your solution. So. You see, that, you see that the reconstructions are perfectly well within the, the input data we got, we use it. So you have, if you, if, you, if you plot lambda as a function of our regularization parameter in the infrared, you have two minima for lambda, so you have here the two, the two uh, solutions for each minima of lambda. They are uh, close to each other with uh, um, the similar, similar behaviors. So you see that there is a negative region for the, um, the, spect the gluon spectral density. So uh, we have also some uh, pre preliminary results for the gluon propagator at finite temperature. Notice that the, the scale for positivity violation is somewhat increasing with the, the temperature. So we can, we can somehow interpret this as, as we go to high temperatures, as we go to high temperatures, we can get a physical gluons at, at uh, above the, the, the at 250 high temperatures, so you will get the confinement at 250 high temperatures. But as I said, these are preliminary results, and we are 
working out this, this case for uh, finite temperature to simulation. So as a conclusion, we have a method to compute the spectral densities that does not rely on the a priori positivity of uh, the, 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 the spectral density. We have shown some results for Landau gauge gluon propagator, some preliminary results for finite temperature, for the gluon propagator at finite temperature. So the, the positivity of violation scaling increases with the temperature, which may suggest that the gluon <laughs> behaves as quasi particle for sufficiently high temperature. Uh, in the near future, we want to, to finish this study at finite temperature. We want also to, to put the, the spectral density for the ghost propagator, and also uh, we are thinking about, we have uh, about two years ago doing, we have, we have, doing, we have done some study for the, um, for some uh, uh, um, scalar blue ball uh, operator on the lattice, and we want to go back to to this case to have uh, to apply our method to physical real physical real physics if you want so real particle that you can really detect on the experiment thank you okay uh, so what would the what would the glue ball look like in your spectral density like what I see a peak like I would see in a normal physical spectral yes, uh, density? Our, our, our preliminary results two years ago, uh, that, that there was some peak in the spectral density, but uh, we have uh, used uh, um, another method. So th we, I have presented here an updated method to compute the spectral density. So in our previous methods, uh, there were some problems, some uh, instabilities, and uh, but nevertheless, as I told you, I can show you the, the plot. Um, we we got so the, the results suggest a peak near the the, the, the mass of the 1.7 GV or something like right. that. Right, right. So and if I understand this, where where you see the uh, the positivity violation, that's where you think the uh, critical temperature is? Is that how you would identify the deconfinement temperature? Um, from this result, I think we cannot uh, really identify the, 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 the deconfinement temperature. You, if you can put the, the clone propagator on the lattice, you, mm -hmm. you, the, the longitude in the component has, um, has a bump, so the the, the longitudinal component of the gluon propagator goes up um, up to the, the, the critical temperature and then there is a, a discontinuity, mm -hmm. there is a, a jump down and the, 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 the longitudinal component goes down for um, after the, the deconfinement phase transition. Okay. But from these results, uh, I don't think you can identify really the, because, uh, well, the, this is just below the deconfinement phase transition and just above, so a, you, you cannot say nothing about uh, the, 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 the phase transition which, using these results, but we are analyzing this and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll report soon. And, and uh, how much of this, I mean, these are uh, gauge-dependent quantities, so yes. how does it uh, depend on your choice of gauge? Well, we are, we are working on the Landau gauge, and in the Landau gauge, at zero temperature, the, the, the gluon propagator has just one uh, scalar function. Mm -hmm. okay? If you go, for example, for Coulomb gauge, you, your propagator would have uh, two uh, different components, and uh, I don't know wh what happens. Okay. We, we are just considering the low gauge that uh, the m many people are interested in this calculation in the low gauge, and that's what we are working on on the moment. Okay. Any other other questions? Okay. Wait, you're next. 
No, I just wanted to uh, understand there was a plot where you vary mu and the values depend on the mu zero, a mu sub zero, this uh, cut off. Should the results be independent on this cut off? Hmm? Yes, should should lambda be independent of mu zero or or no? We we have studied how lambda uh, what is the how lambda depends at, at the function of uh, mu zero, and we, we found two minima. That, that's all. Okay. Okay, Rich, your question. Well, I'm not just sure what core. Uh, what's the exact correlator you're measuring? Mm -hmm. What is the exact correlator you're you're looking at? It's a Lando gauge, but what is the source? Did I miss it? The I don't have you the so what what we are trying to Can't see it because of the like last light. Oh, uh, a, a mu of p, a mu of minus p. We're looking at in Lambda. And what do you do with the, what are the color indices in that filament? Sorry. There are color indices in that filament as well. Do you contract them for color? A yes, is, uh, a, is a, a three by three matrix, right? A is a three. Um, the three by three matrix belonging to the SU3 algebra. Okay, so what do you do with those indices? I contact the, the, the both the... Um, the sum over all eight components? I just want to know what you're, you're measuring, that's all. Okay, so... These are, are um, space-time components, right? Yes. And uh, this... The color indices are even, somewhere, somewhat even, because you have the you have this right. This is the the SU3 generator. So specifically, you 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 have the trace of a mu. A P A U A sorry. And then you get you get A by taking U minus the address and like that. Um, so you you have here the the generator and then you can pull out the the real numbers from outside the trace, and you get the trace of T A, T B, and the delta A B. Sorry. On the lattice, you just have the, the link. So you write A as U dagger minus U, or U minus U yes. dagger. Yes. Okay. And then I you, I write U minus U dagger, and then I subtract the the trace in order to have a trace less a. My question is the following: If you're getting a negative sign, it must mean that you don't have a Hermitian correlator. Isn't that correct? Sorry. I, I thought that if I took any source times its conjugate, no matter what phase I was in, I would get a spectral function which is positive. The, uh, I forgot. I'm trying to understand this negative spectral function. Okay. I thought if I took any, forget about the gate truths. I take a source and it's conjugate, right? And I thought the inner product on that would always be positive definite. But where, where is the minus sign coming from? I mean, if I take any op operator times its conjugate, I'm, I'm, I must be wrong because it's, a, it's, a, it's in my back of my mind that I would get a positive number no matter what. I take a source and another sink conjugate. Mm -hmm. Certainly, with gauge invariant objects, that's always true, right? No, uh, no. Yes. Even if I take like a 
A, a scalar correlator is a gauge invariant object. Even if I look at uh, A, you know, the A1. No, let, let's take pure glue. Take glue, it's pure glue, right? Right. So if I take some plaquette here and it's conjugate there, obviously it's already real. But anyway, right. Then I always get positive correlator, right? Isn't that correct? Because I, I have a Hamiltonian in between two sources. The Hamiltonian has a positive spectrum. The spectral density is the is the eigenvalues of that. Yeah, I think it. Um, well. So is it because of gauge? Are you gauge fixing time as well? It's a, it's a total gauge fixing. Yes, total gauge. Okay, so that means there's no. D mu a mu equal to zero. The lunar gauge. Yeah, so it's a non-local thing. You get the gauge is fixed all the way. Well, I know in if you have if you try and do quenched propagators. You can see the same kind of thing happening. Yeah, but that's not a Hamiltonian. Yeah, I'm because sure. you don't have the Hamiltonian. Yeah, but this is exactly. pure gauge, right? Hmm? This is pure gauge. Yeah. Yes. Right. So this is this is a perfectly well-defined positive definite Hilbert space. Before yeah, but is, a, in la, is in is in gauge, I guess. Yeah. Well, then I guess it's probably no space at all because you've done some non-local fixing. If you only fixed it on slices, then I think you could have to have positive. I'm not fixing. I just when I, I fix it all, all the lot. And you know that this is a sign of. I just didn't know this. Okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or degenerating. It's because of the gauge fixing, I guess. Okay. So let's thank Paolo again. And uh, this closes uh, the workshop. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you have something you want to say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. I just went, no, no. <laughs> this is for you. Let's, let's thank George Fleming. <laughs> for organizing this. It, it takes much more work than you can imagine. I've done it myself, and it's really a, uh, a lift. So thank you very much. It's a very nice place, lots of good food. And thanks to George and other organizers, do we think? Yeah. Or it's all you by yourself? No, I mean you. No, come on. I mean, I, you, you did the real organization. Uh, yeah. Next time, we'll, I'll work harder to get travel funding. So that was, yeah, that was the one mistake. We didn't get the grant in soon enough for travel coming. Right. That's right. If you're interested in hosting the next one, then uh, you should start now. <laughs> start now raising the money. And, and uh, you know, this. I think with this workshop, it's it sort of whoever declares first, I'm going to do it, you sort of win it. So. Yeah, I, I really like, plus also with the, the now's really a good time to be focusing on this domain of composition and multigrid because it just, now's the, it's good that somehow there's a community of people keeping on top of this problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe Wuppertal's the, the logical next place. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, um, so actually we have a reservation at 1 o'clock. I guess I overestimated uh, when. But this, I think at this time of day we could probably just go there and tell them we came early and we'll get a table. Um, uh, so um, why don't we, uh, so we'll end the session and uh, end the workshop and then let's meet, I guess, in uh, half an hour. Uh, at the, for people going to Great Wall, we'll just go to Great Wall, be there, plan on being there in about a half an hour or so. The reservation is under Yale Physics Department, and uh, just tell them we came early, and they'll find a seat for us, 10 people. Um, okay, any more uh, questions or any comments? Great. Okay, thank you all for coming, and enjoy the Lattice Conference in New York City for those going on to New York City, uh, and thank you for coming.